There is much advice provided covering what to say in an investor pitch. Equally important, but less discussed, we'll peruse the opposite side of this issue discussing what not to say in an investor pitch. Given the volume of examples, we'll present this topic in two episodes. This is episode two of two. Our favorite tools for entrepreneurs podcast addresses tools and concepts that are useful for the launch and growth of entrepreneurial ventures. Your two hosts will be Professor Gary Palin and serial entrepreneur Ryan Beck. Well, hello, Ryan. How are you today? Couldn't be better. It's a beautiful day. Brian, last time we had our podcast, we were talking about statements you should not make to an investor during a pitch. And we had a number that we had left over, so we decided to do a part two. So this is the part two of that podcast. So if you like what we're talking about here, go listen to the first one first. That makes sense. Let's talk about what you should not say pertaining to technology. What I hear is our technology will carry the day. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many technology products those out there listening, but technology is often the backbone of entrepreneurial startups and is always one of the more difficult aspects of it. Typically, it's a total scramble up until the finish line once you really look behind the scenes. And this is coming from a fractional CTO for a living. It gets pulled off, but carrying the day is an overstatement. There's a lot that goes in behind it. I always start thinking that someone's is focusing on technology push when they make that statement versus market pull. Right. Which is defined as a product that you've created that you're trying to shove down people's throats or shove into consumers' hands rather than listening to what the market needs and developing something that's getting pulled into the market. There's already a desire there. I would always prefer to have, as opposed to a technology or a product in search of a market, I would prefer to have a market in search of my technology or my product. Luckily, at this point in my career, I turned down more CTO gigs than I take. I managed to get to that point. And oftentimes, that's why it gets turned down. It's because there's not really a market. What you're developing is cool. I can nerd out with you all day long about it. But where is it being deployed? Who's actually going to use it? And the answer typically is... It's just really cool, <laughs> which doesn't make money. How about for, again, this is a pure startup with a technology business. We don't need a tech co-founder. We can always outsource our technical needs. That's a recipe for disaster. And you will end up hiring someone like me to come in and try and fix what has happened if that's the route that you're going to go. You really so need you someone at least on the team that can understand what technology road mapping, what technology design is so that you can stay ahead of it and stay a key input to those decisions. Or somebody's just going to make those decisions for you and they may or may not be in the best interest of the company. We were speaking before we started recording is that you speak two languages and that's one of the big values you bring to any business you're working with. You speak the language of business and you speak the language of tech. And those are two totally separate languages and two totally separate cultures. They are. And the cultural aspect is key. The communication styles are different, how they like to interpret information, what their day-to-day -day looks like is different. So understanding that and working together to adapt is ultimately how you get the best outcome. Absolutely. Here's another one. We are almost finished with our prototype and we will be in full production in three months. That's a big one, right? What is your prototype? Can you show me where you are? You hear that quite often. And what that really means is we're stuck. We've run out of money. We need you to bail us out so that we can actually finish what we tried to start. Following up with that is I hear, we're 90% of the way or 95% of the way through our development. And we only have 10 or 5% left. But what they forget to tell you is that 10% or 5% less will take 90% of the time. Yeah, or cost 90% of the amount. Yes. We've done a lot of thinking. That's gotten us 50% of the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is way too much fun. How about during Q&A, I hear this. We don't need an exit strategy. Just really quickly, Q&A is questions and answers. So typically at the end of a pitch, you'll open it up to questions about parts of the presentation. That means you don't have one, not that you don't need one. At some point, you're going to exit in some way or another. If you are in front of an investor saying that you don't need one because you were never going to exit, it's game over. 
they need an exit to recuperate their funds. And that exit strategy, if you wish to continue on the business, could be some sort of buyout strategy. So once you hit a certain milestone, converting their equity in cash, give, getting them out of the business, but that's still an exit strategy. Those that are thinking in terms of creating a job for themselves, they may not be thinking of an exit strategy, but you can be assured the investor wants an exit strategy because this is not a lifelong pursuit for them. This is a monetization strategy for them. They're not donating to charity. They probably have an arm of their personal finances or fund to do that. And you're typically not talking to that person. <laughs> Here's another one I hear that's based on the question of what is your value proposition? Because if you haven't addressed that in your pitch, you've done a bad pitch. But what I hear is what does value proposition mean? You really need to know that. <laughs> I mean, that would be a giant red flag. If you didn't have a value proposition or didn't understand your value proposition to the market, why are you investment worthy? Okay, here's another one I hear often. And it's during question and answers. They'll say to the investor after a question, I don't think you understand our technology. Or they'll say, I don't think you understand our idea. Quite honestly, I don't think you understand. Just that in this statement alone is a red flag. That just means you haven't done a good enough job of explaining it. The onus is on you to make sure the people in the room know what you're talking about, not on them to cotton on to whatever you're saying. Very often I'll hear that statement from younger entrepreneurs and they're usually talking to more seasoned investors. And what I hear, especially with, you don't understand our technology is you're too old. Oh, funny. I can totally understand that. And I can understand the frustration from the typically young person that's trying to explain new age or cutting edge technology to somebody that might not interact with that every single day. There are parallels that you can always make, especially if they're going to be an investor, understand who you're pitching to, what makes them an attractive investor to you. So why are you talking to them and how can you bring that into a relevant situation for them? Absolutely. If they're not a technology investor, then why are you talking to them? And if they are a technology investor, they probably do understand it. They just don't like it. Exactly right. And I think of that when someone says, you don't understand our idea. In my mind, it's the same thing. Well, I perfectly understand it. I just don't like it. And we've all heard that before. I've been in pitches where it's a cool idea. They're just not talking to the right people. Going back to my time when I used to work with that angel group, often they would make an impact statement and I could already tell this could be pretty cool. They're not getting money here though. It was an eye roll situation. Oh man, we're going to have to wait through this 10 minute presentation. We're going to have to do the obligatory 10 minutes worth of question and answer, knowing this is in the right sector. It's not the right time. It's not, you're not in the right place. This next statement, and we've touched on it in the previous podcast a little, but I wanted to go into it with Q and A. And it usually revolves around when they talk about valuation or control, the nascent entrepreneur will say, but it is our idea. Yeah. A lot of times that is in Q&A, right? They feel somehow attacked. The conversation of what the investment's going to look like has maybe been brought up for the first time. And they're trying to yank that ownership back towards themselves. Look, if you're in an investment, you're bringing someone onto your team. It is quickly going to become everyone's idea. And if you're not phrasing it in that way, you're not ready to take an investment or probably grow your team at that time. Absolutely. There are some general, I don't know if it's statements per se, but things you should avoid using or saying. I see people will use the current jargon with the component of sounding savvy and experience. What do you think about just using a litany of the current jargon? I often find that with technology. I definitely have a above average, if not expertise level of understanding of jargon. And I will listen to a pitch and think, wow, if I don't understand what they're saying, no one in this room understands what they're saying. And you're right. It's often puffery. That person thinks that by using jargon, so very industry specific terms and layering it almost, they're sounding more intelligent or like they know more about the industry than they maybe do, or they're just trying to like prove that somehow by being difficult to understand. 
Yeah, this is one of my pet peeves when someone uses phrases like we hope, we feel, we think. So we hope we achieve our milestones. We feel our sales expectations are reasonable. We think there is a market for this. To me, they might as well say, we pray we don't lose your half million dollars. That's funny. Yeah, I think pitches are a time to display confidence. And that and the other thing that I always advise any sort of pitch is be data driven. So don't hope, show me why. Don't pray, show me the statistic that you're using the calculation to make this assumption. I agree. Data carries the day, not your feelings, your thoughts, your beliefs. It just doesn't work. Right. Okay. Last one is don't argue with the investors. I have seen many a great pitch go up in flames in the Q&A when it becomes an argument. They want to tell the investor that they're wrong somehow about a statement that they've made. Oftentimes you can see it happening that the person just gets defensive, right? They get asked a difficult question. They get a prying question maybe, and they get their back up against the wall and want to lash out. And that's just a sign of emotional immaturity, to be honest, low EQ, and will directly write you off out of a pitch. And the investor may be wrong. Just don't argue with them because the problem is that investor will never invest in you with anything. Right. You got to understand that a pitch is a sale. That's what it comes down to. Why would you argue with the customer? You're trying to get something out of this. That kind of sounds bad, but that is the reality. So you need to put on that salesman face and make sure that you're doing everything you can to address questions, create understanding, not argue with someone. That was my last issue I wanted to cover and everyone finds what not to say very valuable because as I said at the onset, every one of these I've heard multiple times and some way too often. Yeah, way too often. In fact, they're more common that some will show up in a pitch or presentation than not. Yes. So avoid the eye rollers. There we go. Sounds great. Well, you have a great day, Ryan. You as well. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to our Favorite Tools for Entrepreneurs podcast. As always, you can head over to profspirit.com to check out more resources and courses designed for you, the entrepreneur. Please follow us on Spotify. Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and others to get the most up-to-date information as it is released.